Good morning, everyone. It is really, really good to be with you today. It's great to see you in person. It's great to be in your homes with you. Uh, It is lovely to uh, be able just to spend a a bit of time with you today. I do want to take a moment and acknowledge that this has been a heavy week. I was talking with a seminarian friend of mine who is just now finishing law school. He's got a lovely family of three kids. He's black, and his reaction to the guilty verdict in the murder trial of George Floyd was one of exhaustion. He is drained. I just hate it that it takes a video of someone dying to finally prove what black folks have been saying since slavery, he texted me. A while later, he sent me the viral video of the shooting of Makia Bryant. More grief, more injustice. George Floyd and Makia Bryant should be home with their families right now. Our justice system is unjust. Our nation and our world is broken. And there is a lot of work to be done. In confession, in lamentation, in reparation, in reform, which is why we pray for justice and reconciliation, which is why we are committed as a parish to this work inside of our walls, which is why we engage in active listening, humility, and peacemaking. And honestly, we should take a page from our youth, who are about to sign off right now and go engage in this peacemaking work with Rose Castle. They are acquiring tools and learning for how to listen and engage. And hey, youth, we're proud of you. We really are. Yeah, we can clap it up for the youth. (laughs) We are. We, um, we're proud of you. So uh, we want to pray for you, youth who are signing off. Would you all here and at home join me as we pray for our youth at all angels to endeavor in this work of peacemaking? Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we are so grateful for our youth. We thank you for Rose Castle and the way in which they teach and facilitate and equip um, our students, our, our children, our, our friends to be able to be peacemakers in this world that needs them now more than ever. We pray that your spirit would so guide these conversations that you would teach them to lay down their life for their neighbor in humble and generous conversation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my friends, what is the way forward? How might we move through this time in wisdom with discerning minds and open hearts? We now do what countless have done before us. Let's turn to scripture. To 1 John chapter 3, our text for today. You can find it in your bulletin. And it was read earlier by Aziz. As we continue in this series laid out to us by Jimmy a few weeks ago. About how, in the light of the resurrection, do we become new creation people. New creation people. Our text, 1 John, is written to a divided church attempting to live in fellowship. They're trying. A letter written to the church on how to be the church. And as Jimmy reminded us the other week, it's hard to be the church. Didn't you say that? Yeah, he did. It's hard to be the church. It's hard to love one another. It's hard to even love the people you know. It is. And yet, in this Easter season of resurrection... We are brought together in one body and fellowship through the love of Jesus. Okay, so 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. And this, my friends, is the one verse we're going to speak to today. We're going to keep it simple. We know love, how? Through a specific action 
not just a feeling, but rather a choice made by God on our behalf. Jesus laying down his life, submitting himself to death, and defeating death so death doesn't have the final say for us. That's the love. That's the love of of Jesus, the abiding nature of our unseen God, whose initiative to save us from sin in sending Jesus now offers us a responsive, practical way to live, a new way to pattern our lives, a new way to conform our love by laying down our lives for the sake of our neighbor. So I want to spend some time today helping us to wrap our minds around what it looks like to love one another by laying down our lives. I want to tell you a story that is uh, quite personal to me. It's, it's about my family, and usually this kind of story, I, I wouldn't uh, use a script, but I, I need to stay to it so I don't veer off, because it's, it's, it's here. It's, it's right here in me. This story is about my mom, my dad, and my brother, all of whom I love very much. And for the record, I have asked them permission to tell this story. So thank you guys for letting me tell this story. And I asked their permission, and I want to tell this story because I think it illustrates what it looks like to lay something down. I think it illustrates what it looks like to lay something down. I've been trying, honestly, I've been trying to think of other examples to share. Maybe one's not so fraught or that make me feel quite so vulnerable, but we are learning, we are learning how to be truth-telling people. And I can only speak from my own experience. I'm learning this too. I come from a very conservative Catholic family, which values moral fiber and always putting family first. My brother and I were always taught to do the right thing. My parents care deeply about raising sons of good character. In 2004, my brother Chess came out as gay, and it turned our family upside down. Our tight quartet splintered apart, and I was caught in the middle. On one side were my parents, who at the time said they didn't raise a gay son. On the other side was my brother, who said, this is who I am and have always been. My parents feared for his salvation, and my brother feared that he wasn't loved. My parents could not affirm or accept his lifestyle, and so my brother, seeking wholeness, distanced himself from my family. There was a long time, I mean years, where the four of us didn't talk on the phone, or be all together in a room. We had once been so close. I remember the first Christmas that he didn't come home. My dad had said to Chess that his partner wasn't welcome in our house. And so he chose just not to come home at all. Now, I love my parents and my brother very much. But back then, They could not hear each other. They couldn't hear each other. They were stuck. They couldn't work through their differences. And as a teenager, I drifted away from my brother. I didn't know how to speak with him or love him or be in relationship. And these are years that I deeply regret. This went on for the better part of a decade. I'm a little fuzzy on the precise timeline, but I clearly remember a time when things had changed. It was Easter, and I was living in D.C., and I called my parents to say, Happy Easter. My dad picked up the phone. He goes, Hey, John, one second. 
puts the phone in his pocket. He's like, I got to go run out and say goodbye to Chess and Robert. They're leaving the house. So my dad put me in his pocket, walked outside. It's a Schmidt family tradition to always see off whoever's leaving. Uh, so my dad shouts after them. He goes, hey guys, Chess and Robert, thanks so much for coming. It's great to have you. I love you both. They drive off. My dad picks up the phone. Hey, sorry about that. Happy Easter. Dad, I said, I love you both. Robert is there? What is going on? (laughs) My dad sighed, and he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, John, I realized that if I did not change my mind, I was going to lose my son. Later, at my brother's wedding, my dad stood up to give a toast. Today, he said, I have the privilege of celebrating my son. But not only that, I have the privilege of welcoming another son into the family. My parents didn't just change their minds. They changed their hearts. Over the course of a decade, my parents learned how to lay down their lives. They realized that God was bigger than their own convictions. And to love their son and his husband and stay in relationship with them, they would have to let go of certainty and the way that they thought things should be. This was not easy. It went against how they were raised, it took humility, and they didn't always get it right. But damn it, they tried. They tried. My brother, my brother met them where they were. He was patient and loving and mostly understanding. He stuck with them when he could have turned on his back and then walked out forever. He stuck with them. And now we are a family again. A family of five. I was proud to stand with my brother at his wedding. Now I'm not telling this story to you today to affirm your views or change your mind about what you think about same-sex marriage. I know that All Angels has a fraught history on this issue. It's been years since it's been openly discussed. I've seen people dance around the conversation or jump out of the way altogether to avoid it. But I want to say something this morning. Let me just say this. I steadfastly believe that all people need to be welcome in this church. And I share this story, my story, as a personal testimony to what reconciliation can look like and how laying down our lives can lead to love. This is the reason that I'm in the Episcopal Church. It's the reason to extend myself to those who might not agree in hopes of seeing and knowing and experiencing a God who is bigger than our divisions. God is bigger than our problems and our divisions in whom all else falls away inside of his love. Now, I'd like to check in with you all. (laughs) Checking in, shared a personal story from my life. If you find yourself feeling upset or if you find yourself feeling offended, I'd like to pause and I want to lean in there. My intention here is to be honest with you, to tell you the truth. I am not trying to hide. All Angels has just constituted a search committee for a new rector. This 
is an Episcopal church and many priests in this denomination and in our diocese are going to be affirming of same-sex marriage. Your wardens have placed no conditions on the committee or as they do their work, which means the next rector may hold a similar view. And I'd like to ask, can we begin? Can we just begin? Or after a long time, pick up a conversation about this. A conversation where we can be undefended, self-aware, a conversation where we seek to listen more than to be heard. A conversation where we can model humility and curiosity. My hunch is that this will be quite challenging. I've been engaged in a number of conversations recently that have left me sensing, friends, we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do if we are going to have conversations like this one in a charitable, mutually edifying way. There is not a strong culture of truth-telling in this church. And that is a muscle we have to learn how to develop if we are to move forward in health. Because without trust, without trust, Telling the truth is impossible. And more than anything else, what I've experienced in this church is a lack of trust. So I ask you today, this is for you here, for you at home, has a spirit of fear gripped you recently? Do you feel rising up in you anxiety? Do you feel anxious? Do you find within yourself now the desire to defend your views? If so, I get that. I get that. I experience those feelings too. (laughs) And I want to level the playing field, not to diminish anything, but to say something simply. We are all just people, and we are trying to do the best we can. We all love this church. But how are we going to speak with love if we are gripped with fear, clutching the things we are afraid to lose? I I want to take us back to the uh, example of my family and what allowed them to lay down their pride and set aside their personal agenda for the good of the whole. What was that? It was patience, it was the passage of time, and it was paired with the ability to be gracious in their disagreement. To be gracious in their disagreement. Because I think, and I have not asked them explicitly, sorry, I didn't ask you guys, what undergirded this decision to lay down their lives was a fundamental question. I think it was this. How do we hold this family together? How do we hold this thing together? We don't, we don't want to lose each other. How do we hold it together? How do we love each other? Friends, this church is a family. Whether you feel like it or not, we're a family. What we need right now is patience, the passage of time, And learning how to remain gracious in our disagreements. Asking the guiding questions. How do we stay together as a church? How do we hold on to one another? How do we love each other? I just want to to try something right now. I just want to just go with me. Trust me for a minute. I know it's cheesy. But I'd like you to close your eyes. I'm going to lead you through something real fast. Just close your eyes wherever you are. And I want you to picture a person right now in this congregation who is hard for you to love, with whom you disagree. Is anyone else just seeing Jimmy Lawrence flashing through their brain? (laughs) Sorry, sorry, sorry. Jimmy, I love you, man. Um, That was your shout out. 
Um, no, okay, sorry, that was uh, uh, not responsible of me. Okay, you have your eyes closed. You have in your mind the person with whom you disagree in this church. Do you see them? Can you picture them? Now ask yourself, how can I lay down my life for this person? What will it take for me to be undefended around them? Look them in the face now. To practice self-awareness around them. What would it take to do that? To try and listen to them more than for yourself to be heard. What would that look like? And to model humility and a curiosity around their perspective. As you look at them with your eyes closed and you see their face and you know what they think, what would it look like for you to be curious about that? To ask questions? And here's the question you ask yourself as we close our quick meditation. Are you willing to be changed for this person? To potentially not just change your perspective of them, but to have your hearts be changed by them. Now open your eyes. You've just taken the first step in learning how to lay down your life for the sake of your neighbor. Congratulations. Congratulations, you did it. I'm serious, clap it up with me. This is the first step. This is the first step. What you have to do is visualize this and think about this. When I sit in a room with someone that is hard for me to love, can I look at them in the face and model humility? If you can't do it in person yet, go here, go here. And let's go there. One final word before we close. As we seek to be made whole as a family, as we graciously disagree and model humility, there's one more thing we need. Do you guys know what it is? Jeez, Jesus is always the right answer. <laughs> well done, yes. And what we learn from Jesus is the model of love. We need more love. I want more love. I want more love in this place. I need, we need to become more like Jesus. Why? Because his love is perfect. Because his love is perfect. And what does perfect love do, church? It forgives and it drives out all fear. Perfect love drives out all fear. Fear has got no place in our lives. Fear does not have a stronghold here, my friends. And fear, if you are listening, you are not welcome in the sacred bodies of my brothers and sisters. You are not welcome there, fear. And we cast you out in Jesus' name. I am serious right now, y'all. Fear is not welcome here. We don't need it. We ain't got time for that. No. No fear. And Jesus, I know you're listening. You, you are welcome here. Come into this space, Jesus. Come now, reside in our hearts. Make your home amongst us. Help us to be a family that loves each other, Jesus. Mend our brokenness, bind up our wounds, and do the thing you promised. Draw near to us. Draw near to us, Jesus. I know I'm asking for a lot of participation today. I'm just feeling it. I need you to say this with me. I just, I, I, think, I think if we say it together, it's like an invitation to God into our family. So, so we're going to say, draw near to us, God, okay, on the count of three. You at home, you're doing it too. You watching, you're doing it too. No one's going to know, but God, come on. Uh, you, on the count of three, you're going to say, draw near to us, God. It's an invitation, okay? So we extend this invitation together, ready? One, two, three. Draw near to us, God. Yes. Come on, God. You've heard it. You've heard us. We want you. We need you. Draw near to us. Brothers and sisters, we can do this work because God's Spirit is alive in us. We just invited Him in. 
This is what it means to be a new creation people. The old, the fear is gone, is passed away. The new, the life, the spirit, it's here and it's now. Amen.